Chat with Traders, episode 116. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What's going on, fam? Hope all is well. On this episode of Chat with Traders podcast, I have with me the co-founder and CEO of of T3 Companies. His name, Sean Handelman. T3 is one of the larger proprietary trading firms in the US. And in case you're wondering, the three T's of T3 stand for trading, training, and technology. A few of the things Sean and I spoke about include how he got his start, how he lost all his money twice, and why it was a worthwhile experience in hindsight, and some of the great lessons he's learned in the business of trading. And even as CEO today, Sean is still very hands-on with T3's automated trading. So we also had an interesting conversation around this. I think some of his comments and views may actually surprise you. And hand traders need not feel neglected because there is also something in this for you too. Before we skip to the interview, I'm just going to give you the heads up The audio quality isn't ideal, so I do apologize for this. However, I think it gets a little better as we get going, or maybe I just got used to it. Anyway, folks, please welcome Sean Handelman. Yeah, I was expecting to catch you on your drive home. What's the deal? You you knock off early. I have uh, something called Tiger 21. It's this uh, organization that I, I was I was able to leave at four um, or four fifteen. Um, they bring in speakers. It's all you know, high net worth investors and and CEOs of companies, and it's pretty cool. And uh, so I do it once a month. And today was a day, and I did not realize it when I made the appointment. I probably wouldn't have made it, but <laughs> we'll roll with the punches. <laughs> so what is it? It's like a, a made up type of thing. So Tiger 21 is a group like, uh, there's a bunch of groups like this in the U.S., like YPO, Vistage. Um, they're, they're, it's a gathering of high net worth individuals um, that get together and uh, um, you have to have a certain amount of net worth. And they talk about estate planning, investments, hedge fund investments. We have speakers come in. We did a uh, event out in Boca um, two weeks ago where Michael Bloomberg spoke, Tony Robbins spoke, uh, Zell and Byron Ween was there. Like, I mean, you're, you're meeting Usher was sitting next to me. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> Full on. So what are you, are you just a member of that or are you? I'm just a member of the organization. There's about 400 members total um, around the US um, and uh, I'm just a member of it. Oh, that sounds awesome, man. I'm actually trying to get Tony Robbins on the podcast. I know he's not a trader whatsoever, but I think it'd be really cool to have on. <laughs> well, yeah. I think uh, I think there's a good chance it might happen. I've been in touch with his PR guys and he's got a new book coming out. So, hopefully, uh, that might be a bit of an incentive. We'll see. We'll okay. see. Fingers crossed. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> he's fantastic. So, as we know, you're the CEO and the co-founder of T3 Companies, but where did your trading career very first begin? Take us back to that point in time. Sure. So, uh, after I graduated from the University of Michigan, um, I got my business degree within the next three years as well. From I got my MBA at Stern Business School, uh, and my trading career started on a on a mortgage desk. Uh, mortgage-backed securities, commercial-backed securities, trading desk. Um, they, we also traded government securities, municipals, um, at a company called Greenwich Capital Markets in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, I slowly went up the ranks um, at that end, um, um, at that company, um, where I was on the trading floor, dealt with the salespeople and the traders. Also, interestingly enough, dealt with uh, computer programmers there um, and had a small team of people after three years. And then in 1999, I decided to move away from that space. And I had some friends of mine that were, were active traders in the markets in, in, in around 1999. And I decided to, to uh, move over with them and start, a, and start a business. The business was trading. Um, I proceeded to lose my money totally probably two times where I went from 
I think I started with just fifty thousand dollars and um, lost that within three or four months. Uh, put in some more money. I think I lost that too, uh, if I remember correctly. And I kept kept at it. Uh, became a very uh, talented trader. Um, did some all types of strategies from uh, technicals to stat arb. Uh, I was a very um, always a very high volume trader in the equities and option space, mostly in equities. So at that point in time, I was trading a lot of volume, trading most of the high beta names um, at that point in time. It took, me, oh, it took me about 18 months to get good. And then from then on out, I started my own business uh, in uh, T3. Uh, prior to that, it was called Nexus, Nexus Capital. Uh, at Nexus, we only had like 40 traders. And from there, uh, that was about 2003. And then in 2007, um, I merged with Sperling Enterprise to form the now company called T3 Companies. Right, right. So, there's a lot going on there. Let's break that down a little bit. So, I just want to go back right to the beginning. Were you ever a, a retail trader, like sort of in the, in the typical sense? I always had a retail account where I had long-term positions um, starting in uh, 1997, uh, graduating from school or, or even early before that. Um, I used to read a lot of Peter Lynch, um, one up on Wall Street. He, he's one of my favorite guys. Um, I, I used to call it the... Uh, this is where my interest started, even before, probably in high school. Uh, my interest started in trading in 93, 94. And in that time period, uh, Peter Lynch used to say, you know, they, they called it the cocktail hour, the, the cocktail theory, which I don't know if that's the right term, but it was close to that. And basically what it was is, is whatever you like to do, whatever you hear your friends talking about, whatever the coolest thing in at that point are stocks that you should invest in. So I'll never forget, I have the same book that I read back in 94, 95. I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe even earlier than that. And I remember writing down Dell, Subway, which was private, so I couldn't buy it. Um, It was Dell, Subway, Cisco, Microsoft. Didn't have Apple because Apple wasn't in then. But I remember it was a few stocks and I probably, Oracle was another one. um, And I probably had one or two losers that we, we probably never heard of at this point. And I remember putting in, I didn't have that much money, but I used to work as a tennis instructor over the summers at a private country club. I did that for about eight years. And I used to make decent amount of money. I was an entrepreneur right from the start. I made decent amount of money. So I ended up putting, I remember I put between five and $10,000 in all of those um, positions. My parents, I was lucky enough to have my parents pay for my, my college, my schooling. Um, so I had extra money from the summers where I think I was making around $15,000 a summer and I had that extra money to, to put into the stock market. So as a retail trader, I was bought, I I always bought names that I liked, um, that people were talking about. Um, and those were the names at that point in time. I remember subway. I still think subway might've been my best one, um, because I used to love eating there that grew my portfolio massively because that's the time period where, um, the dot com bubble was starting, and I remember buying an apartment. I proposed to my wife. I bought her a ring. So I did make some money um, off of the money that I made off summers. And I also made some money off the money that I was making at Greenwich Capital, um, where I was in mortgage bond securities. That was in a retail account. So I thought I was a genius. I'm going to go into active trading because I'm, I'm the genius, which, in my opinion, if I would have thrown darts at a dartboard, I probably would have picked great stocks for, in that time period because everything went up. But I got lucky, and then I bought my apartment in New York City, and so I took all that money out and bought the apartment. Luckily enough, that was where, where the bubble started popping, um, 99 in that, in that area. So I went into active trading at that point, and, uh, and, and, and that's really where it started. Okay, okay. I want to pick up on that point where you said you lost your money about two times over. So was that when you went into business for yourself, or was that before that point? So, so I, I would say three big points in my life where I graduated from the University of Michigan, and I remember coming home and saying to my parents, I'm going to live at home, um, you know, can I have 500 bucks for the month to buy, you know, food, whatever, and I, I'll just never forget, my dad said to me, you know, you just graduated college, there's no more money coming to you. So, at that point in time, you know, they said, if you want to go to business school, we'll pay for business school, um, or figure out a way to pay, but starting today you know, you know, we'll have dinner, you know, we'll make you dinner. So to me, 
my bank account at that point in time was close to zero. I mean, again, I had those $10,000 investments. I had some money in the bank. It was a portfolio that I was thought I was going to hold forever. So that was a, that was, that wasn't a zero amount. Then I bought my apartment and I was cash poor because I had just gone through Greenwich capital markets and Greenwich capital markets. I was doing very well. I made, I, I, I ended up, you know, breaking the six figure mark, which was exciting for me. And then from there, I, 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 I wasn't saving that much money at that point because I had expenses. I had just moved in. I bought my apartment in, the, in New York City. I was, you know, living, you know, probably above my means um, at that point in time. And I remember I had $50,000. I probably had, a, you know, $100,000 in the bank. I put, took 50000 of it, put it into an account to actively trade and proceeded in three months to lose it um, where my closest friend um, helped me trade. And act, the active trader market was difficult and it took, it was expensive to learn how to trade at that, at that point in time. Um, it cost money because were, we were buying thousand share lots. And I remember stocks like SDLI and QCOM, like they were moving extremely fast. So um, that, 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 that area was, was difficult. It was difficult to navigate and it took some time to get used to it. Um, I think one of my friends lent me some money at that point in time because I needed a couple dollars. So that was one of the times that I didn't have much money. Then I started actively trading more. I did do well at that point in time, um, made some money. Um, then in 2002 or 2003, I started a hedge fund where I did okay. It was a stat arb hedge fund. Um, it was still actively trading. It broke even. It, did, it made a little bit of return. Didn't, didn't make or lose that much money, but it was expensive to start that business. So after I started that business and didn't receive income for two years around that amount of time, all my savings at that point again was gone. So that was my second time I pretty much went, went back to zero. And I can tell you, you learn a lot when, when your savings goes down, um, especially to zero. Um, you learn how to, how to do the most important part of trading, which is, uh, which is being risk averse and knowing your downside of every trade. I would take that to the, to the vault with business, with trading, um, anything you do in life, understanding the downside risk and the risk reward on anything you do is extremely important. So you said in your answer there that you lost, when you first started actively trading, uh, the first time you lost your money, you lost it in the space of about three months. Do you know the reason why you lost that money so quickly? So I'm going to, I'm going to use the analogy, which I will never use the analogy that gambling is the same as, as trading. Cause that's, 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 that's not, I, I disagree with that. Cause you're, you're trying to make your reward higher than your risk. When you go to the casino, which I don't do, but if you do go to the casino and you go there and with a thousand dollars in your hand, most people say to themselves, this is entertainment cost, and I'm going to spend a thousand dollars. And if I lose it, I lose it. And that's it. In trading, in my opinion, at that point in time, the $50,000 was a $50,000 to learn or get educated in how to trade. Now, that's not fun because I didn't know that that was going to happen, obviously. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have done it. But if I didn't do it, I probably wouldn't be on the phone with you right now. Uh, so uh, um, that was, you know, that was a, it was an eye-opening experience, but it was a very good learning experience um, losing that money. I know that sounds crazy that, you know, you learned a lot from losing money, but yes, that's the way everybody learns in trading, in my opinion, um, by looking at all your losses, how to prevent them, how to risk manage them. So that was a great experience to me. And looking back, I wasn't happy when it happened, but looking back, I'm happy it did happen. Yeah, yeah. What did it feel like the second time you lost your money all over? I mean, was there some sort of, would, you know, you said that you, you're kind of glad these things happened and that really helped to get you to where you are now. But, you know, in the heat of the moment, how did you feel at the time? Like, did you feel defeated? Were you sort of uh, put off to actually try and make something again? Like, what, what was that like? Sure. I mean, look, anybody that's lost money in their life feels at the lowest low um, that you can. You get very concerned about w what your plan is for the rest of your life and if you're going to have kids and how you're going to support people, how you're going to support you know, do different things in your life that you want to do. So it was very, it was very difficult. Um, and it was very hard to handle. The second time wasn't really a trading loss. It was more of, 
not making money for you know while running a hedge fund, which there are expenses to hedge funds like audits, um, administrators, um, risk management teams, programmers, or whatever it might be. Um, and that was the second time. Um, but that was more on the business side. And maybe that was understanding the reward side of the model, which I didn't understand. Understanding it now in, in the hedge fund space, you need a lot of money to, to if you're going to collect two and twenty on a hedge fund model. You you either have to make really good returns or have a lot of capital. Um, I had neither. I didn't have a lot of capital. I think I at the max I was at fifteen million dollars, and I was running fifteen million, and, and and that's just not enough to run. You know, if you're looking for ten percent uh, steady returns. Um, so that was the second time, but that, that was more of a business loss or, or a business stagnation versus a trading loss the first time. Yeah, that makes sense. And at the hedge fund, um, you said that you focused on statistical arbitrage. That was kind of your, your main strategy, uh, at the fund was the strategy itself sound and you just didn't really have the enough capital to support the fund. Uh, it was a little bit of a mixture. I don't think it was doing well enough, and the knowledge that I have today, uh, the knowledge that I have today, and if I had better staff and better programmers, and I call them the MIT Caltech guys um, on my team like I've had more recently, uh, I would have done a lot better. Uh, I'm not a quant. I'm not a math guy. I'm pretty good at math, but I'm not a programmer. I don't know the C++ or C Sharp or Python or any of the ways to analyze data like you need to. Uh, so I was a little behind the curve then. Uh, and would I have done better? Of course I would have if I had more capital to, to use either. Probably not on the trading side. That doesn't make a difference. To me, if you have less capital, that usually makes your returns higher because you're more nimble, less slippage, and so on, less market impact. But if I had more capital for the business, I might have been able to build it into something different. Okay. So, let's just summarize a few of the things we've been talking about here, um, particularly around the business side of it. So, what have been some of the the greatest challenges which you actually experienced, which you perhaps uh, didn't expect to experience uh, from running a trading business? Sure. So, that's more recent. So, when Nexus started and T3 company started and T3 Live and um, all the different pieces, uh, there's a lot of challenges. Um, there's from challenges in partnerships to challenges in, in cash flow, um, which, which to me is, if pe- people that know me well, I'm very into cash flow. Um, all that means is uh, make sure you're actually receiving money more than you're spending on every given month. doesn't always happen. But to me, I've learned that lesson where you want to keep your cash flows positive. Now, that might create a lower risk situation and you not going for it and making a lot, a lot of money, but that is a good way to keep a company stable like I've done really since 2003. And Sperling um, Enterprise, the, one, the company that we started, I mean, that we merged with, started, I think, in 99, if I remember correctly, or 2000. And... So we've been in business for 17 years. It's not very common for almost any uh, trading companies. So what I've learned over time is cash flow is cash is king. Keeping the cash flows positive is very important. And the second piece is 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 to diversify. Obviously, so um, one thing that I've done is you know try to understand if the market is not volatile, um, what would happen if the market is volatile? What would happen um, if we back too many traders? Directly, what would happen? Uh, right now, our sweet spot is around 20 to 25 percent of traders we back. We fully back. A lot of the traders have a bank or capital in their accounts in the broker dealer, which I haven't gone over yet, which I can. And, and on the business side, th- those are some lessons that we've learned. You can't always focus only on trading. There has to be a lot of things to focus on. I mean, you know, our business is run with a, in a lot of different ways. We we can't just employ or have traders that do technical analysis. Sometimes technicals don't work. We need the fundamental guys. We need the quant guys. We need um, the stat hard guys. You, know, it, you name the gamut. We need the news traders, the Momo traders, the momentum guys. If you're really been building a business, you have to have different suite of traders because if you don't, uh, what will happen is every trading style is not going to be in, st- in style at that given moment. And usually what happens is it's a, it's a good diversification tool or a hedging tool to have different types of traders. 
Okay. And just to put things in perspective, how big is T3 now? Like you said, you started 17 years ago um, and you merged with another company during that time. How big is T3 today? How many traders are on your team? Sure. We have, um, we have about a thousand active accounts. Now, we have two separate broker dealers. One is a retail broker dealer and one is a prop broker dealer, uh, a prop or professional trading broker dealer. The the, pro- the professional uh, prop broker dealer is a Philex broker dealer, which is overseen by Philex. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, which is overseen by FINRA. Um, that broker dealer, all traders that come in have to be licensed. Uh, we have seven offices um, around the U.S., only U.S.-based traders. They trade equities, options, Forex. Um, we've traded futures over the years. We don't trade that much in the future space. And those, all those people have to be licensed. Um, it used to be the Series 7, then it was the 56, now it's the 57, but they all have to be licensed traders. And the way it works very simply is when Dodd-Frank came out or any kind of uh, Volcker rule or any kind of rules that have come out in, in the space, hedge fund people um, with the high regulations or anybody that has capital that wants to be, that wants to get more leverage, they usually come to a place like ours, um, which we don't have many competitors in the space. Um, on, on the prop side, on the retail side, there's a lot of competitors, but on the prop side, there's really not that many. And so on that side, we have those seven offices and what a normal structure would be is something similar to, um, I run a hedge fund with uh, $10 million or I'm on the Goldman Sachs trading desk or, and I'm running a small book of $30 million in biotech. Uh, if I go to T3, if I'm running a hedge fund, I run $30 million and 2 million of it is my money and the rest is investor money, and you come to T3, you might have to put in half a million dollars for capital contribution, which is locked up for one full year for good capital rules. You put up half a million dollars, or you put up even $25,000, and you can get a much higher amount of buying power allocated to your account. So for example, if somebody puts in $100,000 as a capital contribution, which is good capital, they could receive a $2 million pad. So they can trade up to $2 million and they get a very high percent payout of their capital. In another sense, they can come to us and say, look, I have this great track record. Look at, look at how well I've done. And then we would do something like a 50, 50 deal structure in a prop model. We make money on things like commission. We can make money on profit splits. We can make money on interest. And that's how, you know, the, the, those are the different uh, features or ways that um, a company like T3 Trading Group would make, would make money. On the retail side, it's pure retail. It's similar to opening up a, and that's a completely separate broker dealer. That is a FINRA broker dealer. That broker dealer you don't need to be licensed in. It's, it's very similar to opening up a, uh, a Scott Trade or an E-Trade account, but we only cater to active traders. So maybe our competitors in that side would be interactive brokers or trade station, um, which both those companies do a great job. We probably cater to even more active traders. They could be high frequency traders. They could be just super active traders that are turning their book over multiple times in a day or multiple times in, their, in a week. So both those businesses together, we have a lot of, a lot of accounts in mean, both those entities. So of the, on the professional side, you back about 25% of those traders, correct? Uh, yes, it's about 25%, yeah. And that ranges from 20 to 30% probably. So how exactly does that work? Because obviously when someone comes to you, you're giving them, like you gave an example there where it was like 20 to 1 buying power. Does that not mean that you're backing them by by giving them that buying power or how does the actual backing process add to that? It's a very good point. We basically back Everybody. It's a hundred percent. We, we back everybody. It's one, it's, it's one capital base. Um, and, 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 and we back everybody. So that's technically what our firm does. What I was saying is sometimes people have none of their own capital at risk, but there's all types of ways to look at this. You know, if a trader makes a hundred thousand dollars, do they keep some of that money up in their account? Usually we, we would want to have a cushion because if somebody makes a hundred thousand dollars and you give them 50%, and they lose $100,000 the next month, it doesn't really make much sense because then, you, 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 you know, the, the firm makes 50, then they lose 100, and then the firm is negative 50 and the trader is positive 50. That wouldn't be fair. So there's all kinds of things with holdbacks and banks and, 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 and different types of payouts and structures. And for T3, 
we cater our business really to the trader. Our ultimate goal is, is not to have the trader trade too much or, 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 or do any of those things. What we're looking to do is get traders to make themselves money. And, I, and when I meet with traders, I always say that it's very important for you to make money, for us to help you with either technology, tools, charting, um, T3 Live, which I'll go into a little bit, um, for us to help you make money. If we can help you make money, you become more loyal to us, um, part of our team, you become, you, you last longer, you, you, you trade for a much longer period of time. Ultimately, selfishly, we would make more money if you make more money. We, we can open up second accounts. We open up black box accounts for that person. We can open up um, uh, a swing trading account for them if they're a momentum trader. Um, we've done all types of things to try to get that trader bigger. We can say that we're going to back them in a different account. Um, a lot of times when we back traders, it's not them coming off the street it's usually them being with us for about a year and getting a phone call from the head of business development and, and, and they would say, can we back you? We'll take a, we'll, you know, we'll take a much, uh, uh, we want a much bigger split of your P&L because you're a great trader and we want to get you bigger. We're willing to take more risk on you. You might not be willing to take risk on yourself because you know, that could be scary for an individual and we want to take risk on you because we see that you're a good trader. So, going back to a comment you made earlier, you said you trade uh, stocks, forex, and options, and very little futures. I'm just curious to know why why futures is is not a main focus. And forex is not a main focus either. I mean, we're we're, we're mostly equities. Second is options. Futures. I'm going to be upfront with you. I don't understand it well enough, and it's a high levered product, and. I need to have the right people in place to understand the risk side of it, like I said from the beginning of the conversation, before I trade it. Um, Forex is another one that we do, we do some with, um, and, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, Forex slowly is for the same exact reason. You know, we want to understand it. I want to hire people to risk manage it the right way, and we have those people, but it's a 24-hour market, and there's other difficulties in both those spaces. All right, time out, guys. I just want to give a quick shout out to Proper Cloth for sponsoring this episode with Sean. As you've heard me saying lately, Proper Cloth is the only name you need to think of when it comes to dress shirts. Proper Cloth are the much needed solution to finding a dress shirt that fits you perfectly. Proper Cloth have a foolproof process that makes it incredibly easy for you to order a custom fit shirt online, which comes with a perfect fit guarantee, and you won't even need a tape measure. Shirts start from just $85, so very affordable, and they have over 500 premium Italian and Japanese fabrics for you to choose from. So, to look sharp and order a shirt today, go to propercloth.com slash traders and use the coupon code traders. This is going to save you $20 on your first shirt. Just to repeat the link, it's propercloth.com slash traders. Also back in this episode is Amazon company Audible. With Audible, you have a prime opportunity to make the most out of your commute in the new year by listening to all those books you can never find the time to read. So, while traffic's crawling, your knowledge is building. The Audible app is free to download on iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows, meaning you can access your audiobooks anytime and anywhere right from your smartphone. And when it comes to selection, you're spoilt for choice. You've got books from Jack Schwager, Tony Duff, Scott Patterson, Mike Balafure, Rishi Narang, Mark Douglas, Brett Steinbarger, and so on. You can't make more time, but you can make the most of it. Turn your commute into something more with a free trial at Audible. Go to audible.com slash traders to start now. Moving on, you're the CEO, co-founder of T3 Companies, but you are still very hands-on with the actual automated side of trading. Uh, so, I want to pick up on that a little bit. Can you talk to us about what you do and the types of strategies that you're running, uh, the automated strategies? 
Sure. So I'm not going to get obviously too deep into it, but I will give you some ideas of really how automated trading works. It's very simple, much simpler than most people think. Um, the difficult part is building the infrastructure around it. I was on, uh, I was on CNBC once in my life and, and uh, against Mark Cuban and a whole crew of people that were really uh, difficult um, I was sort of uh, blasted very quickly right when I got on there, which I didn't know that was going to happen. And it was really about one general topic, that high-frequency traders have some advantage over the normal retail guy. Um, I dispelled that, I think, um, in that conversation. But what I would tell you is this. The problem even with my high-frequency uh, trading today, um, or, or T3s, not mine, but T3s high-frequency trading today is really around the fact that we're not willing to spend enough money on infrastructure to compete with the bigger high frequency traders out there. So, and, and I'll get it, I'll get to your question, but I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. So there's market data that's very expensive. There's routing that's very expensive. There's getting the futures line from Chicago that's expensive to, to, to give you some leg up. Um, there is uh, co-locating in Carteret, which we do. We have multiple co-locations, NY4, Carteret, um, Hudson, a whole bunch of places, co-locating your servers right where the exchanges are, getting connectivity to everybody. Then you need to do the compliance side and the regulatory side and the risk side. Um, then you need the programmers that are the best of the best. And still, when you come up with the best strategy, I promise you there's somebody else out there that also came up with that same strategy that's slightly faster than you. So that's where it becomes a problem. We've done everything. I, I'll be up front. T3 was much more successful in high frequency trading and um, from 2004, all the, from Nexus years, all the way up to uh, um, 2008 was, was, was the best year. Um, and then all the way up um, through the flash. We just have a statistic just now that we, over the last 10 years or 12 years, 96% of all days we've been positive in, in that time frame. And, and the days that we were negative, to be upfront, were probably closely related to a software glitch or, or, or something like that. Nowadays, it's much more difficult. So we're, we, T3 is still making money on the technology side, and we're still having that, that percentage. Actually, in the last two years, it's over 99% of positive days. The problem is that we're just not making as much money as we used to. Um, there's just not as much opportunity because there's more, it's a more crowded space. More people are coming to it. Most of the strategies that we run, and this was, could have been my biggest mistake in the history of mistakes because um, when Hudson River started, when, uh, when Virtu started, all these different companies that were doing this way back when I, when I started doing it, smartly on their parts, they started hiring a lot more people. I always, I always didn't want to hire a lot of people because I was waiting for the space to get crowded because it was too easy to make money a while back. And it just... I was. I wish I did what they did because they they built a much bigger organization around the technology. Where I lean more towards the trading side. Most of the strategies that we run are momentum type strategies, very high frequency strategies. The other piece that I don't do because I don't believe in it, and or I do it extremely little, is have passive orders, posting bids and offers. Most of the orders that we put in are taking liquidity. Now. There's a big reason why since 2004, I did that. I thought, and I was sort of right on this one. I was wrong about not hiring a big team, but I was right about this one a little bit, which is there's a huge regulatory issue in my opinion. And we've done studies on this where 98.6% or approximately 99% of all orders in, by bid and offer are not real, which basically means that you can go out and say, I'm willing to buy this company at $10, but when somebody's willing to sell it, sell it to, you know, hit the bid on, on that $10, 99% of the time that person's not there. And then you have spoofing and layering and all these things came in, came to be. And then the, the, this is why the this is why high frequency got a bad name because their comments were, well, I could get filled. I could get filled on the bid. So I've stayed away from having passive orders. If you look at the spiders today, SPY, you'll see, you see bids and offers flying up and down and you're like, what is going on? A lot of that is the same people flashing in and out. Most of those orders, most of those quotes on the bid and offer are not getting filled. So I've stayed away from that. Now, I think a lot of people made a lot of money doing that. 
um, and playing the psychological game, I stayed away from it. I'm happy I did. Maybe I would have made a lot more money, but I know there's been some regulatory issues. Um, so I'm happy I stayed away from that. Most of the strategies, again, are buying small share, share sizes. Um, so if you think that high frequency guys are buying huge amounts of stock, you're completely wrong. If anybody thinks that most high frequency guys are, tra- are trading very small size. Now, they can get bigger in their size, but they're not showing their hand. It's like if you walk on the, to the poker table and you had your hand out, you know, and you're showing your hand and you have a whole group of people around you that's all has their hand, you know, hidden, you're going to have a huge disadvantage. So hedge fund guys, they're not showing their, they're not showing their, their orders for real. And they're also not taking liquidity at big size because that also shows their hand because those go off as prints. So most of the, most high frequency traders are usually buying small share sizes. And so do we, but we've done all types of strategies from, from new strategies all the way down to, um, scalping for, for, you know, trying to buy, you know, at one price, um, doing AI artificial intelligence, where we're learning, um, machine learning of of how one particular stock might trade in a given environment. So we've done everything. I mean, you name the strategy. I've probably done it. I've done short-term stat orb. I've done every, every type of equity strategy, um, somehow in our, um, in the last 10, 15 years, we've done it either on the manual side or on the, on the high frequency side. Okay. So a lot of what you're talking about here is latency sensitive strategies to this day. For are me, you, yes. Yeah. Are you running strategies that aren't so latency sensitive as well? Like, cause you said right at the beginning of your answer there, you said, you know, most of the strategies are very simple, but the, the tricky part with automated trading is that you need the infrastructure, but you only need the infrastructure if you're running or, you know, to a certain degree, if you're running very latency sensitive strategies, correct? It's a hundred percent correct. So when I said it was simple, what I'm saying is if you have a strategy today and you say, um, if a stock has an ATR average true range of a dollar and you figure out what you're, you know, you figure out, I want to trade these 200 stocks today. And you decide that anytime, um, any of those stocks go through its 52 week high and retraces half a percent, then buy. It's a simple if then statement. They all are. So if this happens and this happens and this happens, then do this. When I say it's simple, that's really what it, that's all, that's all it is. It's not some crazy, um, yes, they get, those statements can get really long and people are looking for every type of advantage um, they possibly can, but it's, the the process is simple. It's what you learned in math class or in anything that you do in life. And when your brain thinks of, if a trader is sitting there, I always tell traders, like, know what you're going to do. If Trump gets elected, these are the 20 stocks I want to trade. If Hillary gets elected, this is what I want to do. If we have um, gas prices go up. These are the stocks I want to short. These stocks I want to get long. That's an if then statement. This is what I want to do. If a- anything, if there's a terrorist attack in France, again, what do I want to do? If there's a terrorist attack in New York versus Florida, what do I do? If, if there's a drought in California, what do I do? It's an if then statement. You're literally walking through the steps um, you know, you might want to buy trucking companies if you think, um, uh, you know, people are going to have to, uh, uh, you know, you have to know each and every single little if then statement, no matter what you're doing as a trader, it's the same thing on the high frequency side. Most active traders, people don't really understand that's what their brain is doing. If somebody goes high bid, then I'm going to take the offer. If the spread decreases to three pennies, from an average spread of 10 pennies, I am going to take the offer. This is what most traders are doing in their head, and that type of thing can be automated. The problem is that if you would have done that in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, you would have done extremely well. Now, that space has been flooded, and it's much more difficult to succeed. The medium frequency trading, we do also. So the low hanging fruit for the super high frequency trading, it's very difficult to make money at this point. Um, we still do pretty well, but not as well as we used to. And um, it's difficult. It, it definitely is difficult. There, there's a lot of big players out there that are, that are taking that low hanging fruit. We are involved in some medium frequency uh, type strategies. Um, we work with traders to build strategies for them. Um, that's part of our technology group. So 
all kinds of strategies. I mean, they, they could be technical type strategies. Um, my partner, Scott Redler, he talks about the red dog reversal, 80-20. Those types of strategies we can, I'm not going to go over the strategy, but that kind of thing we can automate. So if you have any type of if-then statement, you can automate it. And I think there's some great technology out there outside of T3 that, that does that for you. I'm yet to hear people being very successful doing it because I think the space is crowded, which is my opinion. So when you say that you think this, the space is crowded, what exactly do you mean by that? And why is that a disadvantage? Sure. So like any other business, I say the turning point was when there was a, there was a programmer at Goldman Sachs. The cat got out of the bag. The guy took the program. They, and then everybody started looking at Goldman Sachs's uh, uh, 10K and quarterly earnings. And they're realizing that a lot of their earnings was coming from black box. And there was one programmer. Uh, I don't remember exactly what. Uh, I think I do know his name, but I'm not going to say. But there was one programmer that went to another company. And there was a big lawsuit. It was all over Wall Street Journal and everywhere. Um, that, was, that was literally when that happened everybody started understanding what was going on um, in this space and it became much more crowded. So anything in life, if you want to sell hamburgers and McDonald's opens and then all of a sudden there's Wendy's and Burger King, trust me, McDonald's would be doing a lot better if Wendy's and Burger King weren't around. And we all know that. What happened was that there were only a few players in the high frequency space. And what happened once it got out that, that people are making this much money um, which I thought that was the turning point, just my opinion. When that happened, everybody flooded the space. And when everybody floods the space, you know what happens with anything. It becomes everybody, we're, we're all sharing the dollar. So if there's X amount of dollars to make, if there's $100 a year to make, and there used to be 100 people, now everybody's making a dollar each. Now there's 10,000 people. You're breaking up that, that $100 a lot more. That's what I mean by crowded. Yeah, I, I thought when you when you made that comment um, just before I asked that question, uh, you were referring to more of the mid frequency strategies, but I must have misunderstood. So, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the, I, I was talking more about the high frequency, but medium frequency strategies. Interestingly enough, look at the VIX today. The VIX is going straight down. Everybody's asking me, Sean, what do you think? Why, why, why is the vol- why is VIX so low now? Um, look, my personal opinion is I think, you know, the fix is that it's crazy how low it is. And at some point it's, it's, it's going to turn, but I still think that things are priced in very quickly. Go look at when earnings come out, what happens to the stock. Go look at when news comes out in the marketplace, what happens to the market. It goes straight down and then it goes sideways. The reason why that's happening is because the boxes, there's so many people doing the high frequency, super high frequency stuff that everything's being priced in quickly. On the medium frequency side, that is also happening where if you have a stat arb that you're trading Coke versus Pepsi or, or, or a common versus a preferred, things are being priced in to stocks very quickly. Even if it's long-term pairs or, or, or any kind of longer term strategy, um, that is what's happening. So, Things are being priced quicker. And when things are priced quicker, what happens, in my opinion, is the efficiency and the edge goes away. So no matter what you're trading, if there's a lot of people trying to do medium frequency or high frequency, they're, they're both going to go away slowly or be much more difficult or the best will rise up to the top and it does become more difficult. I, I will say on the medium frequency, it's, it's definitely a more even playing field because it's not as expensive to run a medium frequency type of box. So um, you don't have to be co-located. You don't have to have the best routing or the best market data or, or the best whatever to, and spend all that money per month. So with that being said, uh, we had a phone call uh, a couple, well, actually it was a couple of weeks back prior to doing uh, this interview right now. And we were just chatting and I said to you how I was focused on algorithmic strategies myself um, certainly nothing in the in the realm of high frequency trading, more sort of intraday um, and multi-day strategies. And you were still quite negative on the idea. I don't know if negative is the right word, but you, you almost said you tried to discourage me from it almost. Yes, I remember. So, I just want to pick up on that point and hear your reasons for, for making those comments. I think it's going to be... Um, might spark some interesting conversation and might be valuable for listeners to get your thoughts on that. So yeah, please share. Sure. So look, my only, my only date, I'm very a numeric guy. So my only data point is really from experience. And 
um, having traders come to me and saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. If it's in the high frequency or the super high frequency space, um, I would say your success rate is going to be close to zero. If, if it's going to be in the middle frequency, like what you had mentioned to me about yourself, there is a higher success, but I think it's really low. And I'll tell you why, and this is my reasoning, is that I've just watched so many people come to me. I have tried to program people's strategies, and always, always, they've either overfitted the data, they don't understand market impact or slippage, which means when you go to get the stock, you're not just getting the last print, you're paying the spread, and you, you are losing um, commission dollars, and you're also having market impact of the stock. There's a lot of things in slippage in the slippage world that really come into effect. And what I've seen is it might back test fantastically. I don't back test ever, by the way, just as a side note. If I'm ever going to come up with a strategy, one piece of advice that I tell everybody is always forward test. Build your strategy, let it run with a hundred shares, be willing to lose a couple thousand bucks because if you back test and you try to get all that data, you're, it's going to be much more difficult. But when you do forward test, it's still from my experience, the failure rate is extremely high from traders doing something on trade station or interactive brokers or whatever it might be. The success rate is very low. And if they are successful for that very small percent of people that are successful, they're successful for a very short period of time. So that's what I would say. I, I hope that doesn't burst a lot of people's bubbles, but it's a tough market with the volatility where it is. It's probably even tougher. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. It does. So, you know, there's there's measures and things that can be done to try and reduce the amount of curve fitting that's done when you develop any strategy. Um, you can factor in slippage when you're, you're backtesting or your analysis. I know you said you don't do backtesting, but many people do. Um, you can also, I mean, market impact... Yes, that's a, that's certainly a factor, but certainly more so when you're trading bigger size. You know, if you're just trading a hundred spy, you're not really going to impact the market too much. Correct, hundred percent correct. So, you know, with those things being said, do you still feel the same way? I mean, look, I still feel the same way. I mean, look, I mean, you know, I, I would ask you this. Okay, everybody trades spies versus the underlying basket. Everybody trades IWM versus the underlying basket of that ETF everybody's already doing this stuff and looking for an inefficiency in the marketplace, the smart guys, the Caltech, uh, you know, MIT guys, the really good programmers, they're already are taking advantage. The only way you have an edge is if there's something that you believe, you know, that other people don't. Now, back in the day, that used to be insider information. Most people never called it that, even more recently. That doesn't really happen anymore because the, regu the regulations have been so strict. That could have been people's edges, possibly. There aren't any edges out there. <laughs> There's not something that you know, I wouldn't think, that other people don't know, and they have better technology and better programmers doing it. I will say on the medium frequency side, there are still opportunities out there, so I'm not going to be completely negative on that, but there, it's still... Whatever your idea is, it's still going to be extremely difficult to implement it first, and it might cost money to implement it, and it might actually make money, but after commissions and could be market impact, it could be paying the spread, um, whatever it might be, there are implications of all of those things. Have I seen it work? I just built somebody a strategy recently that's working very nicely. They're not, it's not scalable, and it is more medium frequency. I don't love the standard deviation, though. It's making money, but again, the standard deviation is too high for my taste. It's very small, but I'm just saying the standard deviation is not, not exciting for me. So I always look at everything risk-return in a risk-return basis. You know, what's the worst-case scenario? And again, if you're trading small, it's, it's, it's probably okay, but I'm with you. So, yeah, yeah. So what you're saying here is pretty much whatever you find, someone else is, if, not, if they haven't found it already, they're going to discover it very soon. Um, and, you know, that's a common argument that you hear, um, you know, you're not the only one who says that sort of thing, but I just, I kind of have a little bit of a tough time getting my head around that because, you know, surely there's an infinite number of 
different trading strategies that one could come up with, right? Correct. And yours can be slightly different than other people's. But remember, if somebody is generally doing the same type of concept, they are const- the best black box traders are constantly changing. You have to be changing your strategy. So they will be changing their strategy to find. I mean, we run on our test. We, I, I have a test uh, broker at T3. And we, we have uh, probably 300, uh, maybe less than that, maybe 200 strategies running every day. And we're monitoring, and, and we have a, a whole other set of strategies that are running live. So we have live strategies and, 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 and broker and brokerage strategies that are, that are with, without real money, that have slippage, everything categorized in it. We're looking at all those strategies and then we're making changes on them. If one is making money, you focus on the ones that are making money. The ones that are making money, you, you want to turn them live and then you want to try every single different variable variation of every variable that you possibly can to figure out what the best risk reward return would be. That's what everybody's doing. So if somebody's trading something similar to you and there's, and, and you're making good money, somebody's going to find that also. Now, I, I, I have had the conversation I'm having with you right now on this call with so many traders, and I always end up saying, I will help you, we'll do it. And then the always, the, the one year later, Sean, I know you told me this, I, I, I should have listened, um, it's, it's not working, and I, and I spent $25,000 trying to figure it out. And it always happens the same way. I mean, I can, if, if it's, if it's, for every 10 guys, one works, maybe even less, half of one. Out of 20, one works. And these are smart guys. These are smart, smart traders that have been trading for a very long time trying to automate what they're doing. Sure. But that like sort of success ratio, I mean, that's sort of the, the general success ratio amongst traders in general though, isn't it? Fully. But this costs a lot more money though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with this being said, let's say someone is interested in automated trading. They are interested in algorithmic trading like we're talking about here. They're going to push ahead regardless of what you say. A hundred percent. What advice would you give to them? Like what suggestions would you give to them? Just maybe save them and help them out a little bit. For high frequency, middle, middle frequency or active trading, just regular active trading? Well, I, I presume if we talk about uh, mid frequency is probably going to be relevant to more listeners. So let's, let's focus on that. Well, and look, mid frequency is the same as an active trader. In, in my opinion, it's an if then statement that you're, you could be trading, um, manually as well. So it could be a man, it could be a gray box where you're getting alerts. Um, this is what I would tell every trader before they do this, whatever time frame you think it's going to take to get this running, double it, make sure you have enough capital in place to be able to see it through um, and then make sure all of your slippage components are very conservative, meaning almost the, like if you're, if you think your commission is going to be X, do two X, um, and don't overfit the back test. Those would be my, my suggestions. The number one reason why people that doesn't work is because it takes too long to implement and they don't have enough capital to take the losses in the beginning. Those probably are why most people fail on the um, mid-frequency black box type side because they have to pay a programmer, they have to get market data or whatever it might be. That's where I'm seeing the biggest failure rate. Um, The quickest failure is from that. Scope out a plan, pretend it's like a business where you're running a business. That's what I would, that's my piece of advice. Can you just pick up on the point of needing enough capital to sustain the initial losses? Like what, what are the initial losses? Are you talking about if your strategy goes into drawdown uh, as soon as you go live or are you talking about other expenses in like? Both. They're, they're, they're all of those expenses. Um, on, on medium frequency strategies, even if you're trading 100 share lots, you could probably lose more than you might think. Um, the strategy could be good, but depending on when you start, you know, a good strategy would make, would make money 55% of the time on, on a medium frequency, even 50% of the time. And then the winners are bigger than the smaller uh, than the losers. The problem is, is that when you start, that's, that would be a good success rate after six months of running the same strategy and tweaking it and constantly tweaking it and making it better. What most people don't realize is that you're going to have to tweak it. You're not going to come up with a secret sauce right when you do it. It's going to take some more time. 
So there could be losses there capital-wise. There could be your savings loss, meaning you, you thought you were going to be making money quicker. There could be loss of um, dollars for co-location or uh, brokerage fees or market data or, or port fees or, you know, there's, there's tons of different fees that can happen. And then also understanding that if you don't make money for the next year, do you have enough savings to support yourself? So there, all of those three, it's really three things. It's, it's savings to support yourself. It's the cost of trading. And then it's the losses that you could incur while you're tweaking the strategy. Yeah. Okay. And I know I'm jumping around a little bit here. Um, you, you've just mentioned tweaking again. And then a few minutes ago, you talked about you don't back test, but you sort of optimize the strategy and you try all the different variables when you actually go live. Is that not the definition of curve fitting? I know you're not doing it in a back test with in sample data. You're sort of doing it in live uh, to some extent out of sample data. But Okay. So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of what I do. If I have 50 strategies, if T3 has 50 strategies running today, which is around what we have, and I'm running uh, 200 strategies, um, on, we call it a test broker, which is not real money. The 50 strategies that I'm running live, I'm also running those 50 strategies in test broker mode. I'm trying to make the slippage perfect between those two. They're never going to be perfect, but try to make it as close as possible for those two. If I can make those two perfect, and it understands the slippage. I call that forward testing. I call that we're, we're testing all of these strategies, these 200 strategies and 50 are running live. And if they're making money on test broker live, either live or on the test broker, I would want to go from test broker to live the next day, possibly. So I don't know if you would call that overfitting or not, but we have stats, standard deviation stats, one minute bar, but again, I'm more on the high. I'm more on the high frequency side than the medium frequency, so um, it's definitely different. Most of my strategies that I'm testing are on the um, are more on the high frequency side, so it's probably not as applicable to that. But what I don't like is somebody comes to me, take a look at this, Sean. We went back three years and look at these returns. Look at my sharp. Look at my standard deviation. And I, and I start laughing. I'm like, do you run this? My first question always is, do you run this with real money? No. Have you ever run it with real money? No. So I say to them, okay, so you ran it for the last three years. So how do you know that the next three years are going to be the same? And how do you know that somebody didn't run that exact strategy that you probably overfitted over the last three years? Those are the things that I don't like as much and I'm not a big fan of. I do it a different way where I'm, I'm forward. I call it forward testing where you're just actually implementing the strategy with live data, live running, and you're taking the standard deviation of minute bars and, 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 and P and L per trade and doing all kinds of standard deviation, sharp ratios and risk versus reward on those types of strategies. Okay. And out of those strategies that you have running with your test broker, you know, you, you've got anywhere from 50 strategies upwards at any given time. How many of those strategies actually make it to live trading with real money? Oh, very few. <laughs> very few. I mean, well, we're, look, right now we have, 50, we have probably about 50 strategies running. Some of them make, uh, I think I have a strategy that, that, that barely trades ever. And when it trades, it might make $20 in a day. But why wouldn't I run it? Because it, 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 over the last three years, it's always made money. <laughs> so, it, and, and when it makes a trade, it has an 80% success rate. You have to realize... Now, now, somebody might laugh at that and say, well, well, why would you, you know, that's a waste of time. It's not because I already have already built the, oh, the whole infrastructure. So why wouldn't I run the thing that makes 20 bucks every third day? You know, it, there's no energy off me. It just runs in the background. And then you're analyzing that. Um, in terms of the other strategies, usually when they're not working and I'm running them, um, Usually, I'm tweaking those strategies to try to make them work better. We, we see something. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a type of stock that trades better on that strategy. Maybe there's a time of day that, that, that is better for a certain strategy, which is very common. You know, some strategies don't work well um, in the morning um, with high, high volatility. Some, some, some trade much better early in the morning or very well in the last 10 minutes of the day. Let's do this. So, the way you see it in your position – you see a lot of traders every single day. You, you know what's going on. What do you see are the main advantages of 
automated traders compared to hand traders? Like what's the pros and cons of each? Just like the, the big points. Okay. Well, I'll always tell you that on the technical front, I believe that a hand trader is always better. Um, I think they react faster to change. Um, they, they, they can analyze the market faster. I know that sounds crazy. Um, it's not faster. I take that back. The word's not faster. Uh, more intelligently, um, understanding things that are going on in the world or with a stock or um, have seen that same pattern before. Looking at ranges, uh, you know, if you're trading a black box, you have to know a price. You can't look at range. It's very difficult to look at ranges. So as a hand trader, the advantage is pattern recognition, seeing things happening over and over again. And I know there's software out there that does this. I still think the human brain is ahead of, of black boxes in that sense because I see very successful traders. And to me, if you see very successful traders and they're consistently doing well, they obviously have some kind of advantage. I will tell you that the more momentum type traders are going away. The guys, like when I started buying and selling very quickly, the black boxes have taken over that area. That's the area that if you're a trader doing that, start changing your style into a much, into a longer, a little bit of a longer uh, term outlook. It could even be two hour outlook versus buying and selling quickly in three minutes. If, I'm seeing that the, if the whole time is longer, um, tr- hand traders are doing better, which is a case for your medium frequency concept. I just will let you know that um, versus high frequency. And then your question goes to what is the advantage of a black box? Very simple on the black box side, which is the space that I understand well, is you can program something, you can change it, and you can make it uh, do exactly what you want it to do without emotion. The best traders that I see are the ones that don't have as much emotion or get very emotional only when they lose money. Um, they don't get excited when they make money. And they understand that it's like, it's like swimming in a, in, in, in a wa- on a wave. You, you have to go with that wave. If you go against the grain or you think you're too rich or you're making too much money, that wave is going to smack you in the face hard. So I'm getting off topic, but on the black, on, on the automated side, I think it takes out the emotion. You can really prepare prior to the trading day because you can get the strategy in. And obviously it's much faster than a human being buying and selling securities. I will tell you something that we didn't discuss just very quickly is the, the gray box side where it's assisted, you know, picking, you know, it could be a scanning software or something like that. Those, those things are good also that can help a trader, uh, uh, become better and be more selective in stock selection um, or many other things. Yeah, massively. Now, I think that's a really great answer, Sean. Let's do two last questions, quick questions, just for fun, uh, just to put you on the spot. <laughs> Best piece of business advice? Best business advice. Business, not trading, business? Business and then we'll do trading. So, hit us with your business advice first. Um, definitely on the business side, change. And it sounds crazy, but I, uh, you know, there's this, there's a book. It's I think it's a bestseller. Uh, Who moved my cheese? Adapt, change. Don't be scared to make changes. If you, it's more risky not to make a change than to make a change. Um, I know that sounds like a simple one, but it really, really rings true. And my second one on the business side is look at your cash flow. You don't have to be an accountant. It's money in, money out. Very simple. I made a hundred bucks. I spent 80. Congratulations. You have a profitable business model. Um, I am not a big fan of the dot com stuff. I, it does, it's not in my belly to take that kind of risk where I'm spending a hundred dollars on marketing and the return is $10. Change. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, I love the cash flow idea. And then on the trading side, risk management and emotions. You got to keep both really in check. Um, and preparation, I would say, would be the last thing. My, the best traders are, are, are in the office very early, reading, um, adapting um, to new markets, and that's, that, that's extremely helpful. Yeah, and I, th- I mean, I think your business advice uh, highlighting the importance of change is also very applicable to trading as well. So It is, 100%. Adapting, flexible, change. Don't try to beat the market. You're never going to do it. <laughs> Don't beat yourself either. Stay very even-keeled. Have a mantra. Scott Rutherford, my partner, is a perfect example of that. He works out. 
He's, it's unbelievable. He gets into the office exactly at the same minute every single day. He studies the market at the exact same time. He leaves for the gym at the exact same time. It's, it's amazing what, he, what this guy does. And if you, if you live by that stable you know, structure, it actually makes you a better trader. It's weird, but it does. Cool, man. Let's leave it at that. Sean, if anyone listening wants to get more info about you, where should they go? Anybody can email me at Sean, S-E-A-N, at T3professional.com. Um, our website is called uh, www.t3live.com. Our trading website is www.t3trading.com. Uh, 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 um, T3live.com is the education, and T3securities.com is the retail side. Sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Sean. I've enjoyed this conversation and thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Take care. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.